Good morning, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I hope that when you opened your eyes this morning and you, the life upon which you found yourself having was one in which you feel you were deeply wed to and that, uh, and, and that it's so that you wed to it deeply in a way deserving of you and your attention in your life. And so hopefully this video and all, all the videos that we post here, um, perhaps make that wedding more available. So I wanna set some context. I'm really excited about, about this first video, but I wanna set some context for the, this first video, but also it, the, it's gonna be the first of a series of videos. One in which Chris and I, um, enact and read through the Platonic Dialogues. And we're gonna start with a paper that Chris and John Verbeke wrote um, that is precisely about the restoration and the necessary um, bringing forth the Socratic Platonic Dialogues and its intelligibility into modernity, into post-modernity precisely, which I think will give a very good, set a very good context for how Socratic dialogue and its mode and its intelligibility is like perhaps even necessary for our time. Um, first, I wanna do a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll, I'll set the context. So next Friday, I start the main thing that I do um, professionally, which is I, I teach circling, um, the practice of circling. And we have our practitioners course, which is a year long course. Um, there are still a few slots available. So if you're interested in that, go down below and click the link for the art of circling, that's the name of the course. So you only have a few days. So if, you're, if you've been thinking about it and you haven't done anything about it, um, now's the time. So definitely check that out. Also, if you are interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching with me um, or consulting with me, uh, go ahead and email me and uh, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get in contact with you. And I think that's it. So, I'm so excited about this first video to set context for a series, an ongoing series where Chris and I are gonna be reading the Platonic Dialogues. And we're gonna be reading the Platonic Dialogues in a particular order. And it's the order that my understanding was the, the original way that the Platonic Academy, the first Platonic Academy, you know, way back in you know, ancient Greek, you know, before they invented dirt, um, the order in which you were supposed to read them. And it's interesting because apparently the order is not a chronological order. So even in just the order of the dialogues that we're gonna read it is, is I'm imagining I want to disclose the, uh, the intelligence of the order because I'm imagining that order is the order for a particular reason, right? And, you know, why do that? Why, why, is, why am I excited about that? Why, why bother with that, right? And what, are, and, and what are we doing? What are we enacting, right? When we, and I think I'm gonna call this um, enacting platonic dialogos. So to emphasize, as you've probably heard John Verveke talk about in his series that, you know, not, not, not philosophy in the, in, the, in the propositional sense, but the, philosophia and the whole bodied existent, like exercising your existential, existential capacity for deep levels of intelligibility that affect us and connect us with the various depths, heights, and levels of our whole being. And one of the things that I'm really excited about 
right? In in this last dialogue I just did with with Jonathan and and John Verveke, it really it really came together for me, where John had said that that he feels in all of all of the all of the investigations he's been doing on ways in which um, people are addressing the meaning crises through various uh, ecologies of practice, you know, like mindfulness, meditation, circling, authentic relating, um, you know, different forms of embodiment practice, all of these things that are in some way addressing what John calls the meaning crisis. And one of the things that one of the things that John has been saying, and I just really, I just really got it, was that that one of the things he finds missing, and I totally agree with him, is is the philosophia, not necessarily philosophy, not the not the academic propositional kind of philosophy that we normally associate with philosophy, but but the process of philosophizing, right? He's, he's, what he's saying is it may be actually perhaps necessary for that aspect to also be in with these other practices of tuning in emotionally, of mindfulness, of being in your body, of being embedded in the world. One of the things missing is that sense of philosophical insight, aporia, right? And and what he's saying is that like with, without that, that it may be necessary to really address what these practices are, are trying to address to um, be able to be, have a connectedness with the, you could say, the, the ontological level, the cognitive psychological level, and the existential level. That without philosophia, right, that that that's not fully being addressed in a way that leaves us connected, that it may be necessary. And I just, I really, uh, that really gathered itself and kind of showed itself to me when he said it, you know, this has been an ongoing process for me too, of learning about it. Um, so on one level, the reason why we're doing that is to explore and to help articulate and um, and to begin to show a possible example of how to do philosophy, what that is, what it looks like through doing it, through inviting everyone else to do it with us actively or even passively just watching us. So I want this series to be not, not just watching it and, and gaining, being informed by something, but actually being formed by it, grappling with it, grappling with what it is to exist, what it is to be a human being, what is it, what it is to be in a universe, in a cosmos, what does any of that stuff even mean? And to dwell in it in such a way that it can begin to awaken us and that awakening touch all of the levels of our existence that on the most abstract level, all the way down to the most concrete, such that we can have a deep sense of connectedness to the time that we're in and respond uh, with a deep intelligence um, that I believe is what I believe is indistinguishable from human being. So with that, I want to also um, just read something by Heidegger that starts to get at that practice and that space and, and distinguishing it from a different kind of space that usually involves uh, being informed or being becoming knowledgeable. Right? There's a different... There's a different way of piste, piste me, epistemology, if you will. That there's a way of practicing knowledge, right? That's actually an enactment that goes beyond just being useful, right? And there's, there's the space of that kind of knowing that is, that is powerful, yet not immediately you, you tip like it able to be useful in some kind of technological optimizing way. Right? So Heidegger, this is a, uh, a lecture, I believe it was uh, in the mid fifties and it was, um, it was a lecture that he, I think it's a, 
transcript of a lecture that he gave for the death of, I think, some some big name physics back phys, um, physics teacher back then. I don't remember who it is, but I'm I'm going to read the first three paragraphs and then and I'll skip down to one line because I think it really highlights and helps set a tone, rings a bell that is the that is the tonos that that may gather this whole series going forward. Okay, so I'm gonna start. <clears throat> the following lecture calls for a few words of introduction. If we were to be shown right now two pictures by Paul Klee in the original, which he painted in the year of his death, the watercolor, Saints from a Window, and Death and Fire, Tempra on Burlap. We should want to stand before them for a long while and should abandon any claim that they be immediately intelligible. If it were possible right now to have George Trackle's poem, Serpent of Death, recited to us, perhaps even by the poet himself, we should want to hear it often and should abandon any claim that it be immediately intelligible. If Werner Heisenberg right now were to present some of his thoughts in theoretical physics, moving in the direction of the cosmic formula for which he is searching, two or three people in the audience, at most, would be able to follow him, while the rest of us would, without protest, abandon any claim that he be immediately intelligible. Not so with the thinking that is called philosophy. That thinking is supposed to offer, quote, worldly wisdom, and perhaps even be a, quote, way to the blessed life, unquote. But it, may, but it might be that this kind of thinking is today placed in a position which demands of it reflection that is far removed from any useful practical wisdom. It might be that a kind of thinking has become necessary which must give thought to matters from which even the painting and the poetry which, get, which we have mentioned, and the theory of mathematics and physics receive their determination. Here too, we should then have to abandon any claim to immediate intelligibility. However, we should still have to listen because we must think what is inevitable for preliminary. Let me give a hint on how to listen. Let me give a little hint on how to listen. The point is not to listen to a series of propositions but rather to follow the movement of showing. I'm gonna read that part again. Let me give a hint, a little hint on how to listen. The point is not to listen to a series of propositions, but rather to follow the movement of showing. Thank you. Nice.
Okay, cool. I'm recording that too. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah, I, I, and I think one thing that I've noticed, and this helps for also, you know, when you sort of, you wake up in the morning and you're not, you feel maybe um, you feel kind of some lassitude and you feel maybe a bit lethargic or unmotivated, but you know that you have to, you know that you have a sequence of tasks that you need to accomplish, mm -hmm. but you don't feel disposed to any of them. Mm -hmm. And you need a mechanism for motivating yourself to actually tend to the things that need tending. And the thing that I find increasingly useful is the realization that putting myself into a certain state of activity will naturally precondition the motivation required for actually undertaking that activity itself, yeah. right? So most people feel, I think, think, okay, I have to go and do X. And in order to go and do X, I really have to feel like going and doing X, right? So I muster my motivation, I center my will, and then I right. proceed. Right. And when in fact, I find it's very, that's very much the inverse, is that in order to be roused into a mode of engagement mm. matched to a particular activity, you have to first immerse yourself in the activity in order to condition the engagement. Like I find that's very true of writing, right? If I don't feel like writing, the most useful thing I can do is sit down and start writing because inevitably the state of engagement, the way in which the relationship is then lit when I sit down to tend to the activity will naturally condition the, and retrofit me with the motivation to actually continue it. As opposed to sitting on my own, you know, thinking, okay, I got to do this now. I should get up and do this, but not feeling, really not feeling the will. So the idea that putting yourself into certain states in order to condition yourself to undertake certain activities, that to me is an example of understanding how mutable character is. And that sort of a, that's a way of using the wisdom of aspiration, the wisdom of aspired future states as a way of setting the table yeah. for yourself to then be willing to take on certain tasks, right? It's like, well, I, I am not the kind of person right now who can do this, but if I, if I courted myself with X number of conditions, I know that I will become the kind of person who can then do X. Yeah. So being able to then play with your identification Right. And that, like that to me is sort of, it's a, it's a motivational kind of wisdom because it just, you, you realize that you where we are so utterly beholden to the forces that in which we're ensconced at any particular moment in time. Right. right. God, it makes so much sense. When you think about that, I had this picture of, well, how do you get a bunch of, a bunch of instinctless or poor and instinct animals <laughs> <laughs> to do the right thing <laughs> like culture on some level is this yeah you know we we talk about like in the west how free we are but actually i think it's more fair to say we are deeply civilized and we behave very very well precisely because of the thousands mm -hmm. of years and hundreds of years of of history that's embedded in all of our social practices, right? Such that we get up and we are inside of right. boundaries and lines and structures that call out to us the lines that we don't have to think mm -hmm. about that we're walking inside of, right? And so like, there's so many ways in which I wake up that's in the morning right. and I'm in a room and there's, I'm already thinking in terms of What's already laid out for me is this is private. And then there's a sense of public out there. And then I can prepare yep. myself to be public. All those distinctions yeah. are embedded in the architecture of our, of our room. And it's thinking about like, imagine, imagine if every right. morning you woke up and you had to like do all that. You had to like, you had to basically create culture <laughs> from scratch. Start right. from nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. So there's, there's a way in which so many, I would imagine, like our motiva motivational wisdom um, and the way it breaks down, right, is 
is given by the literal ontological um, cultural structures that fashion us. And then you're talking about like, okay, right. So the, all that's kind of built up on, right. And then we wake up inside of it. And then there's this one place where the individual, right. Has a little bit of a choice there and it doesn't feel like doing the next thing. Right. In some way that generative sense of like, all right, right now I can't, I don't feel like writing, which is interesting to think about. Like, so therefore, the horizon upon which I write is precisely the thing that I don't feel, but I can imagine or remember feeling. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes mm -hmm. the thing that consolidates, right, my will, right, in that sense. But what's also interesting about will, right. that will at that moment, I don't have the will to just sit down and write, but I have the will to to understand that if I give myself over to this activity, if I surrender my will, right, over to this activity, that the will will then be taken up by these other processes. And there's a certain kind of faith I notice and an argument that I have, right, with those kinds of things. That's right. That's you know, right. and I think that you're probably- That's right, that's I would, right. I would imagine okay. you're really appreciating too because you're having you're in a time in your life where you have like more open free time <laughs> where you know i think that people people who work at corporate jobs and have like a regular schedule probably fantasize about like working from home or something like that but then the moment you work from home you realize how indebted you are mm -hmm. to all of this structure right that had all that mm -hmm. to Absolutely. wake up and it's all open to you and there's it can be tremendously challenging to enculturate yourself, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. And that's why you have to find a way to re-simulate those structures and to de redevelop them and personalize them as though they were personal relationships. Sort of like I know that in the moment right now, I might feel prone to my solitude. But then the moment I come and start talking to Guy, I'm immediately going to be shifted into a different modus of engagement. I'm immediately going to be called out and reframed around my discursive relationship with you and who I am and how I feel is going to change quite comprehensively. And so I know that even if I don't feel like accompaniment, mm -hmm. the moment I put myself into dialogue with you, the appetite for accompaniment is going to come as par for the course in the territory. And it's very, very similar with even a solitary task. I know as soon as I put myself into rapport, when I, I will, by recollecting my rapport with the activity, I will recollect the kind of motivation um, and concentration required to actually undertake the task. So it's, you were saying, you know, a, a, you were talking about it as a memoria, right? As a remembrance yeah. of your, of a particular, a particularly disposed attitude. And then really the wisdom of the structure and the wisdom of, of using the structure is remembering how to remember, yeah. right? If I can remember how to remember that relationship, then I'm going to be able to retrieve the memory, even if it's not readily available to me, right? So it's so I think it's, these structures are really sort of these are these are of these sort of proxies for for access and availability. I might not have this state; it might not be imminent to me at this moment. But if I have the means to retrieve the memory of the state hmm. and use it to actually rehabilitate and habituate the state then it's always within my access, even if it's not present to me at this given moment. And I think the wisdom of these structures, especially insofar as they can be personally appropriated, is to be able to access the states required to undertake the tasks required in your higher order desire, right? What you want to be wanting, as right. it were, at any given time. Right, right. Wow. I'm just, I think I'm just, well, what? It's just good to see you and talk with you again. I missed you when you were on your trip. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, you too.
You yeah. too. I feel the same. Yeah, just I appreciate the um, just getting right on and just jumping right into it, you know. And we're in that conversation <laughs> that I feel surrounded by and given by in this way, you know. So much affinity. I'm glad to be doing this with you. Too. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Me too, I, guy. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I miss this. Yeah, yeah. And and it's interesting because you know what I was talking about for for this. For this video, it's just, um, it's just to set some context for a, uh, I guess you can call it a project, or um, I was thinking like a reg, like just a regular time where we meet once a week and we we walk through the dialogues together, right? And I guess depending about uh, like how many interlockers there are in each dialogue, we can invite, you know, John or or Jordan or all the different people that we've been talking to to kind of come along with us, right? In different dialogues, which I think it would be fun. But having you and I be kind of the, um, you know, the ones, the ones that are kind of like, we'll be kind of like the ground for it, right? And then, and then especially like getting hold of the, of the platonic, the platonic dialogues that um, in reading them in the order that they originally read them in the Platonic Academy. Um, I think that what's exciting to me about that is I would imagine because the order, there was an order and it's not, it's not chronological, I guess. There's, that there's, a, there's a wisdom in the order that I want to apprehend, right? Or disclose in it. So. So one of the things I was imagining is like, what's exciting to me about doing it once a week is I want to not only learn what we're reading, right? And be affected by what we're reading, but, no, but every week to be able to talk about the way in which we're um, impregnated by the reading, like how our lives, our lives look different, right? And all the different transformations and shifts and, tensions that that I'm sure that on some on some level in these kinds of things I find they end up being a context in which my life gathers around right I think it's a I think it's a fantastic idea and I think it obviously it harkens to a a pedagogical style that's kind of drifted now into obsolescence mm -hmm. and reviving the entire style of pedagogy is obviously like it's a central feature of our collective project obviously it's john's and mine and 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 ours and um so i think yeah it's it's a kind of philosophic experiment that is the likes of which are now very rarely attempted i think i told you in a previous conversation that um, even though I took many courses when I was when I was still in school that um, that uh, revolved around any number of the dialogues, mm -hmm. the exercise of actually reading them aloud in any kind of dramatic fashion is something that I only recall once. Um, and at the time, it felt I mean it was interesting, but it also felt so. It felt um, I, I think it made people very self conscious, precisely of of how. It, it was something that just wasn't, um, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was it hadn't been habituated into the, into the, the, into the platonic education. And so it seemed almost maybe uncouth to people that they had to be doing this. But, um, but the idea that it's sort of fallen, so it's fallen out of the orbit of such things is like, Right. You want you just you just wonder how conceivably that could have happened, right? Yeah. But anyway, this is all to say it's a great idea, and and ritualizing it with a certain regularity, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then seeing also, I mean, in, in addition to the in addition to the 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 fact that obviously the the process will evolve as the dialogues progress. But, but it's not only the dialogues that will change, but our format of interacting with the dialogues will change. Yeah. And that will be interesting as well, because it's something that I think we'll have to improvise our way through to a certain degree, 
yeah. as we acquire more and more comfort with the project itself and understand how to orient it in such a way that we optimize the, 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 um, the experience, right? So even the way we read it, how we read it, um, how tangential the, uh, the readings are, um, how much we want to background or foreground the reading with historicity or, or footnote it with sort of more, you know, incidental, you know, tidbits yeah. of information, that kind of thing. I mean, there's all of the sort of surrounding, the surrounding uh, procedure of it is yeah. something that is bound to change. And bound to evolve as we go along. So I'm actually just as interested in that. I'm interested to see how we begin, and then how it changes. Yeah, yeah. That you know, I'm uh, a, a few a few different things with this is. So one of the things I can probably put in more concrete language. That has revealed itself in these dialogues, right? That we've been having. Um, with, and since I started, you know, doing these, these kind I mean, I've been do, having these, I mean, I, I would say my life is made of these dialogues and who I am is made of these kinds of, you know, relationships. And as, as you said, in one of your videos, I'm, what I am is constituted is, is it's constitution is made up of all those relationships throughout my life. And I've, I love the way that you put that, um. And through, but since doing this and putting them out public for everybody to watch and having a sense of a living um, relationship with so many different people and an ongoing conversation that impregs, impregnates, right? Each other conversation with each other, right? That, uh, that I'm noticing things that are emerging that were talked about in the beginning, but like have a different character now when, the, when I first heard them, thought of them. And one of them is kind of like talking about, uh, you know, John's, how John would describe it as like an ecology of practices, right? Oh, let's see. I think you're mm -hmm. frozen. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. We'll just work with the, okay. the internet connection. Um, okay, I will have. I'll. I'll. I'll, I'll yeah, I'll have. I'll have resolved this. This discontinuous connection by the time we get into our platonic readings. Okay, good. Good. Because <laughs> boy, would that be a mess. It's maybe it's our <laughs> Socrates, you know, deft hand in in the work right now in some way we don't understand. <laughs> um, maybe. Yes. The. Um, That's a charitable reading. I'll take it. <laughs> Yeah. The, uh, well, one of the things that I, and, and, and it really culminated in this last conversation I had with, with John Verveke and um, Johannes, um, which we were talking about. Uh, and Johannes is a Heideggerian scholar and philosopher. Um, and we talked a, a lot about like Western metaphysics and like the history and the, in the forgetfulness of being that Heidegger talked a lot about, and which is a deep topic that, that you just, I think you just continually understand more and more and more. It has that character to it of, an, of, a, of the, you, you can't ever really get super clear about it, but you can just always be in becoming of it yielding more, the more that you look at it. And my, one of the big questions I had going into that conversation was like, okay, so how, but how does one stand in relationship, right, with, in Heidegger's terminology, the withdrawal of the sense of being, right? And uh, how do you appropriately stand in that, right? While deeply understanding that you're of time, the unfolding of that temporality, right? You are not... You're not creating, you don't create history, right? You're, you, history is realized, right, mm -hmm. through us and we're inside of it. So how do, you, how do you respond to something that's so intense as meaninglessness, right, um, in a way that's, that's in the right relationship with what the actual phenomena that, that's happening? And so 
one I know one of the ways that I think that we're all kind of one way of responding is this conversation, right? right. All of these conversations. And there's this kind of element for me in them of kind of wading through the darkness, like kind of not really uh, like constantly being in a certain sense, listening to the whisper, right? right. The enormity of what's happening, right? But seeing if you can he begin to hearken into the, the 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 thing that's concealed, but yet is 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 whispering in its withdrawal, right? Um, and then John's response to that being like the the meaning crisis and framing it in the meaning crisis and the sense of the ecology of practices and one of the things that we really became clear to me in that last conversation was when, when John said, you know, what's missing for me in a lot of these, like I find a lot, what he said is like, what's missing for me in a lot of these practices that he's been participating in, like meditation and, you know, different kind of embodiment practicing and, and circles. And he's like, is philosophy, right? That, that and, and I, would, I would say that mm -hmm. in my experience, I've awakened philosophy in circling, right? But through, really through the back door, right? <laughs> right? Because people's, people have a lot of inertia that comes up when even the notion of philosophy happens, right? Um, they don't really see it as something that's um, substantial in the way one mm -hmm. lives one's life. Right, they kind of see it more, act and it makes sense because I think in many ways mm -hmm. philosophy has become you know, the pure academia. Um, and so a lot of the people who are seeking more connectedness and do, doing these kinds of practices almost see that the practices are a way to defend themselves or ground themselves in something other than philosophy, right? So there's this kind of motion, mm -hmm. this notion about like, if, you, if, it, if it veers into anything philosophical, people will go, oh, you're just in your head. Like, right, get out of your head, get in your, you know, this, mm -hmm. a lot of the tropes, a lot of the tropes of the human potential movement become kind of like, you know, a club that people beat over each other, on, you know, on the head with uh, in criticism as, as if the realm of philosophy were the enemy. Um, and so there was this kind of dialectic that we were having in which, well, no, like John was saying, like, no, it's not, I, I'm not advocating for philosophy per se. Like I'm neutral about whether or not that's necessary. Mm -hmm. But what he's saying is it's actually maybe necessary, right, for the convergence of the ontological, the, the cognitive, um, psychological, and the existential. That, 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 that we need practices that, have a ha, connect us with the thing that connects all those things together, right? That transcends and includes and integrates and, mm -hmm. and involves the machinery that, that distributes that wisdom all the way up, right? Um, and how do we do it in a way that isn't, isn't going backwards in making claims that aren't viable to us, right? Anymore, which is kind of like, as you would say, I think would be mm -hmm. the, you know, the dying star of Christianity, right? Um, not re-evoking or becoming Christian or becoming that again, right? But looking at the mistakes of it, but also looking at the machinery practices, right? And evoking mm -hmm. practices. And so I really, have, I walked away with, with that sense of like, yeah, I think what, one of the things that motivates me to do this project with you, right? And, and to do it the way that we are, at least start it, is to reawaken the sense of philosophy as being a necessary transformative agent, right? To connect us with our own ground, our heart, mm -hmm. our mind, right? And to the, that which is beyond all of that, right? In a, in a felt way, mm -hmm. restore the sense of philosophy, right? Um, as a ne as 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 crucial and necessary as the other things that that have a lot more claim on us, right? That that's actually to not have that maybe actually 
um, detrimental in some way or uninclusive of, of a whole dimension. Mm -hmm. And I see that a lot in like, especially because I live in the Bay Area, which is like the, you know, it's the, well, it's kind of like where the world's pouring out from, right? On In all of its glory and all of its, all of its weirdness. Um, but it's also yeah. the heart, it's the, it's the heart of the human potential movement or where it started, right? And so there's all kinds of dual, there's all kinds of assumed dualities that separate these two things, right? Um, that people take on because it's part of the culture, but they don't even notice that they're taking it on until the, the opposite, they're opposite, and then they're hostile towards it, right? So I actually, w I, and I want to get a sense of, for me, as one of the, as, as one of the founders of, 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 of something like the human potential movement or the iteration of it, um, is, to move, is, to, is to actually kind of bring back that sense of philosophy. Because for me, that, that's, circling came, circling has is, is not been a therapeutic endeavor. It hasn't been a psychological, personal growth mm -hmm. endeavor. It's it's a different domain. Um, it's been, I would say, that circling has been precisely the thing that's inspired me about it and what what's possible. And this is where I think it's in in dialogue, dialogue in general has awakened a sense of a mystical thread that runs through conversations and can be transformative. And that like, there's the personal domain, right? Like the sense of what it's like being with you and like the personal intimacy, right? But what happens when we bring in the philosophia where the personal can, can be, mm -hmm. can, can be uh, intimate with what calls forth the conversation and, be, and, and, and in a certain sense starts to grant the dialogue, right? with each other in this I thou connection. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, uh, that's where I really thought reading you and your and John's article that you wrote, that's, um, it hasn't been peer, I think it's in peer review, right? Yeah, right now it's in, it's in peer review. Um, and um, so we have, yeah, so, so it's still sort of in draft form at the moment. I guess. Right. right. So we're going to take that. I think that's even makes it even better. Right. We're going to take, we're going to take the draft of that paper. And I thought it re like a really good idea. By the way, that paper just rocks. I love that paper, man. I think you guys did such a good job. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Gary. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it was a, it was I a labor of love. That's, that's absolutely, it's, it was a good example of something that began as one thing and then landed somewhere utterly, utterly different. There was a, it commutated its orientation, its fundamental purpose, uh, its scope, um, its, um, its volumes, I think, ended up exceeding anything that either of us intended simply because we became so absorbed into it. And it took, very, it took on a life of its own. It seemed to have its own agency and it vectored itself in its own direction. So in some ways it was, we were very much along for the ride, which like what a humbling feeling that is. And it's also a feeling of like, you know, you, when your work reaches a certain velocity, you feel as though you're trying to actually keep up with it as opposed to it keeping up with you, that that the 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 entity that emerges as a consequence of that work, that is neither you nor the exercise, but something over and above either of you, or in the case of John and I, something certainly over and between us, yeah. is um, imbues the whole process with a certain humility and a sense of intrinsic significance that can't quite be accounted for by the dimensions of any given project. Mm -hmm. So right. such was the case for this chapter. Right. That's the, yeah. Yeah. I, I, so anyway, thank you. That's very kind of you. And it was obviously, and, and so when it does, uh, when it does come to full fruition, um, anyone who, who certainly um, takes it up and who has also seen our dialogue with you and I and John and Jordan will, will not 
people cannot but see the resemblance, obviously, the, that there's certainly an, an evolution of thinking that is, um, that, is, that is being transmitted from one medium into the other, which is also really neat to me. This is sort of a, this is a, prototy a prototypical philosophic drafting process. Yeah. Yeah, just so, it, yeah, I, I, I kept having that sense of, I kept having the sense when I read it that as I was reading it, you started to, what you, what I was reading, I imagine was so much the very process that was, that wrote it. Like it's very fractal in that way. And you, yes. in a certain way, I could, yes. I, but by, by, by hopeful design. Yeah. Yeah. Like I just really, you really got that sense that like, you're like, Whoa, you're in the presence of the thing. And then you're having to draw on language and vocabulary to try to bring this in. And so just, I get this sense of like new words have different meaning and like the, the I love that experience of where, uh, and I love that that experience of like when you're when when what you're talking about it you realize is the thing that's talking, right? Those moments where it just comes comes through and the right. po the poesis in which the poesis and the technical soundness in which called into articulation was 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 a sense of like oh my god if we I gotta right. put this in this way otherwise it's gonna slip away. But it's the thing that's happening right now is the sense I got. I could, I could just imagine. I kept imagining you and John. Oh, I'm so talking about. I'm so gratified that you had that experience. I'm so gratified that you had that experience because it's 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 a wondrous thing to to know that the experience of of um, of interacting with it as a reader in some form is an an affined is 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 somehow similar um to the process of actually of actually creating it mm -hmm. um create creating it sounds far too willful for the process i've just described it's more like mid, the midwifery again right right simply helping to deliver it okay. um because it certainly doesn't feel like a, it doesn't feel like a like a premeditated form of design at all uh precisely because it's it's a it's a developmental emergence of a kind. Right. Uh, anyway, it's so it's it's yeah it's incredibly gratifying to, to to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, and I just thought, given that what your one of the big things that 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 yeah. my understanding of the purpose of that is to is to awaken and and reveal this the uh, the platonic dialogues and the socratic inquiry and dialectic all the things that come out of that um into how is that relevant now and even necessary now right um and so it's really kind of had this way of taking yeah. taking yeah. That, what is it Oft, oftentimes like i i find the platonic dialogues oftentimes have this kind of um are portrayed in this very classical, dry, logical um, sense, right? Like you read the classics, it's like considered a classic. It's kind of has this kind of academic, yeah. right? Sense of no relevance to your current situation, just historical, like the history of philosophy. But there's a way in where you're saying like, no, like this stuff is, this stuff is atemporal in a certain sense right it transcends a lot of that and this is how in fact yes. it's more necessary now than, yes than perhaps it's ever been yes and so it really situates that wisdom yes. in our modern situation and the ways that you the way that you open up in terms of the loss of the second person as you articulate the problem i thought was really brilliant um yeah and is a great lead oh, thank you I think it's a great lead into the context for how what we're going to be doing, however long it takes, right, to go through the dialogues. It's a great, it's a great yeah. context for that. Right. How's it come to you? Right. Right. Well, thank you, really, very, very much. And and it, it's interesting too because I think, yeah, what you said about the a temporality is exactly right because so much of what we're trying to do in the throes of Dialogos 
is to actually surface ourselves from the temporal entrapments uh, and the noise of the temporal entrapments that form sort of the, the, the way that in which we, we revolve mm. on sort of a quotidian basis, right? Mm. That it's the, the apprehension of eternity in some form is, and I use the term form, right? Advisedly mm. is the, is the aim of the dialogic process, right? The, the imbuing the temporal with the eternal. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and so, because, and, and, uh, and then also the idea, like there are some really fundamental axiomatic, I think, misunderstandings that have just, I think, inscribed themselves prima facie in our understanding of philosophy and the, and the role of philosophy over the course of time. And perhaps the most the most pervasive of those is the notion that philosophy is somehow separable as a category of experience or as a or as one among a taxonomy of activities that we can partake of or not yeah. it's the same it's the same mistake that's been made of religion right the idea that it's a native category among experiences right. uh, as opposed to some as opposed to a way of formulating our experience of being writ right. large right. and i think that one thing that we're trying to do at least with philosophia in the meaning that john um implies when he uses the term yeah is to understand if we are if we are as heidegger suggested living within a question of being then philosophia is the exercise of formulating that question iteratively again and again and again mm. with appreciating exactitude. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That philosophy is the practice of, of philosophy is the practice of like our, you know, we, we, the, the question of being is a, is, a, is a profusion, right? It's something that's very, very difficult to retrieve and refine in ways that give it some kind of, mm. some kind of formal and actionable presence. Mm -hmm. And philosophy is, I think, as, a, as an ecology of practices, let's say, mm. is the process of of interacting with our fundamental question of being mm. and 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 uh, to afford ourselves a graduating conformity with the most incisive version of that question mm. right that there's we don't dehes from philosophy like there's no there's no there's no separation that philosophy is simply the reckoning of the question of being mm. and 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 it, it we are possessed of it mm. so uh, you know i think so i think that perhaps one one um one one feature or one goal of this project is to collapse together again yeah. the identification between the question of being that we live out and the enterprise of philosophia insofar as it's a psychotechnology yeah. in the proper sense of the term yeah. for refining and distilling the question of being in a pragmatic way yeah. um, that we can better interface with reality right and with what is what is in most um, huh. and, and 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 most fundamentally real huh. right the approximation of reality by the endless iteration of the question of being yeah uh, and that's the philosophic enterprise at least as i understand it you know like there's a, like a million etiologies for how what philosophy means and how it came to be and, and fundamentally what its dimensions are but for me it is simply that it's simply an exercise of the an exercising conformity of the self to the question of being yes and that is the philosophic enterprise. And I think that certainly is it insofar as the Socratic project is concerned. Yes. And then the, dialo the dialogic form, the dialogic conformity, right, mm. between us is mm. precisely the 
craft the techne yeah. of that, that most ultimate of question posing. Right. And that tech, like, I love that. Like, this sense of, the, uh, in a certain sense, restorating, restoring techne out of its dominant position, right, um, in the age of technology. But in, in a position of that which, in its craft, reveals what it itself can't craft. It's always subordinate mm -hmm. to something. And I really like how you set, how you wove that together of like, it's, it's not just romanticism, right? Um, just espousing <laughs> the glory of the, of, of the natural or something like right. that. Not that sentimental sense. There's a rigor, right, to our propositions, right, to, to the way we make sense of it, and actually technically more and more profound. But, but when you talked about the pragmatism, I really appreciated that because I right. felt the sense of like, yeah, this is where we start to restore the propositional. And what, what gives it its measure as a valid proposition isn't its ability to make truth claims necessarily, but the ability to stand on them and reveal more of the mystery, right? Of right. that our propositions laid down. And you'll really see this in your writing, right? In the, in the paper we're gonna write. Like on one level, it is profoundly technically precise, but it's like reading poetry at the same time. Um, that sweet spot of like that, mm. that place of uh, where, where yes, we're, as we're going along, we're, we're, we're making sense. And as we make sense, we, we put down a, a stone b beneath our feet right before we step on it, <laughs> right? And so that we can step more and more towards the center as we circumambulate around it. And where I really want to make That's that right. sense of like one of the things that we're going to do, right. one of the things that I think that that people like about a lot of these dialogues and that I'm hearing about, right, that they have a hard time describing what, what it is that they like about it, but there's an attraction towards it, is that it's very rare to equate the, equate the, un, like the, um, the pra those practices that in that have one become more knowledgeable um without it without like without the aim of it being directly utilitarily useful right and and i think that one of the things that kind of philosophia um is a space where what's being talked about and this is where socrates I think continually is misunderstood, right? Um, but with a kind of trickery, continually reveals in the dialogue, which is no, there's a way, there's a, a way of knowing and knowledge that it, that um, cannot be used by you, right? Um, that maybe we can develop a kind mm -hmm. of listening that is powerful but not immediately consumable or useful. Um, and so like a lot of the That's dialogues right. from, from what I've right. been able to tell is like, it, they're frustrating. You're meandering, like, like you, you're, yes. you're solving puzzles and then you realize you're like the act of solving the puzzle, like dissembles the puzzle that you're solving. And, and it's, it, it's not like, it's not like, um, yeah. it's, not, it's not entertaining in this immediate way. It's not really, mm -hmm. you, you, you precisely are lost to the relevance of, how this connects to the original thing we were talking about and everything. And you go through this whole process. And at the end, like people are like, ah, oh, I feel, I don't feel like we at all have the answer to that question, but somehow I don't care. I, I just want to spend t more time with Socrates or <laughs> my vision's more clear. Yes. My, I yes. can see her better. Exactly. Because, be, be, because by the end of the dialogue, exactly. Exactly, because by the end of the dialogue, I am become more. I am becoming more in the likeness of the question itself, right? Yes. I become. Um, I, I I begin to uh, to to. It's like I, I my my um, 
my, my, my being is suffused with the question right. such that I, I, I ask it with, with deeper import and, um, and the scope of the scope of, of conceivable possibility yeah. that that question is able to access is deepened and broadened as a consequence of becoming more in its likeness, right? right? I can ask the same question, but, as if, but if I am myself in more in likeness to the question, then the question has a breadth now that it didn't have before. Right. And it has a, it has a, a it, it, the question itself has changed modes. Yes. Wow. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Rich. And that, the, just the, the, the um, I would say that we are, as, as time has gone on in my lifetime anyways, the amount the amount that, that that a space like that you're talking about, that way, that kind of deep sense of, um, of wisdom and knowing and engaging with these things that aren't immediately useful, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yet somehow grants the eyes that have us see things and to be able to be useful right like um that the mm -hmm. tolerance exactly tolerance for hanging out in that process has become less and less and less in just my lifetime i've noticed um, oh yeah so so this is a yeah. uh, just to set some yeah. context just for the listener and for ourselves is that what we're doing here is not something that's immediately going to be able to like we're not going to solve any problems <laughs> right and if we did we didn't mean to um <laughs> but there's but we're we're um espousing like i want to like a like espousing the opportunity for people to dwell in that right which um can give the eyes of clarity but you could never be clear about in some final way and and uh to start to value that love that that's right and and because if you as yes. David White yes. would say, as David White would say, where he loves, I love this distinction he makes. He's like, he's like this link between identity and levels of attention, right? And you say that, that the more one deepens their ability to pay attention, the, the more one's identity changes in relationship to that attention, right? Because if you start to see, absolutely right. So what we're talking about is like, in a certain sense, is developing and exercising the, the machinery, right? That that, um, that that grant something like uh, the ability to make like more deeper, more refined, more inclusive attention that allow the world to come for forward in such a way that um you'll f that requires someone that someone who could respond to such a world and, and in that sense like it it, it becomes right. very 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 pertinent right but in the, and it, that that to mm -hmm. be said that mm -hmm. is to give um to to open up to like when it hurts and when you're confused and when it's the struggle why be in that struggle is precisely because of that, right? It's, right. Yes. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Ah, uh, that's so well said, guy. Mm -hmm. And then if and then to to to, send, to then recollect this back into the Socratic enterprise, I might say that if the, the purpose of the sort of the purpose of this the the Elenchus as a form of inquiry. Mm -hmm. It is such that if the if the aperture of our attention is adjusted by the questions we live through, then the Socratic project mm. and certainly the version of the Socratic project that we are taking up mm. is an exercise of enlarging that aperture, yeah. right? The 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 torso of ours that faces the cosmos mm. and how 
exposed we choose to make it. Mm. Yeah. So rich. I tell you what, I need to get some water and to adjust a few things over here. Let, let's put the video on pause. Okay. And then, um, and then we can then we come back and make okay. a question and start reading. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just put it on pause. Sounds good. Okay. okay. So Chris and I, we're, we, we can't, you just can't, we took, took a took a break and then of course we ended up talking and then it 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 ran in it, we used up all of our time <laughs> allotted um for like, a, like an awesome conversation that we just got in um so I, my sense is my sense is the best thing to do would be to really just kind of wrap this conversation up with any any setting up any context around what we're doing right about what we're going to start when we start reading um and then we just have this be the first video, just as a, as a setting context. Sound good to you? Yeah, that sounds good to me. I think that uh, I think that the uh, that the aims and intentions are pretty pretty clear. They're pretty clear, and they're obviously shared between us. So I don't know that there's too much left to say, other than this is a this is a wonderful experimental and playful process i think that that we're very knowingly and, and sort of consciently entering into and i'm quite excited about it for its fruits for its its intrinsic enjoyment mm -hmm. um and for 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 whatever come of it so yeah. um yeah i'm looking forward to beginning yes and and also just for the for if this inspires other people cuz one of the big like a lot of i've gotten a lot of comment and people emailing me and such you know really wanting to participate um and th immediately what i found out is like the the, the nature of the con like um the explosive nature of infinity that starts to erupt from that right is is can be quite over and, and limited so one of the things i would be really thought would be cool to do is that i can make a a playlist on my channel right where we where we have these videos and if other people want to participate and they want to make their own videos in relationship to what we're reading um and want to do you know conversations and ways and that are inspired in relationship to what we're saying they're doing why don't why don't you guys just do that and then and then send me a link to those videos mm -hmm. and i can Put them, you know, put, you know, make notice of it. And well, you can just send me the link and then I can title it. So it, it links and I can just post those underneath our videos. So um, that way everybody who's participating can, can listen in on what the other thinking is around what they're doing and the impacts. So I just thought that would be cool to gather those in the same place in some way, in a way of, um, a way of inviting participation, yeah. right? Su such that in a, in a way that we can actually do it right i don't know if i'd be if i'll have always have time to listen to everything that's right but um i want to give everybody the option to do that to participate in that way yeah i i think we're we're inevitably going to come up on sort of the, the 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 economy of the process will have very natural constraints and time being the chiefest among them yeah. so i guess we'll, we'll, we'll i think we'll probably have to adjust in an ongoing way how we uh, how we approach the question of of more communal participation i mean i as a as like the spirit of it i think is 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 exactly in accordance with right. the practice itself and the undertaking and i liked what we did i i liked the process of direct videos mm -hmm. obviously it's 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 not like it's not practicable to be doing it as frequently as we would like simply because of how how time consuming it is and how many worthwhile uh comments there are very very thoughtful comments to go through so i think maybe what we can do as well as we proceed is to have our eyes peeled for different ways of uh of of enveloping the uh enveloping folks who are who are along for the ride sort of in the margins of the conversation and bringing them into the crosshairs of its scope yeah. um and we'll, we'll just sort of see we'll be open to creative suggestions too on that front i think yeah totally all right
All right. I look forward to this. Thank you, Chris. Me too. Thank you, Guy. All right. You have a good day.